Right, good afternoon everybody. Uh, we're going to have a look then at uh, Syria this afternoon. Uh, have you all seen Syria on the news pretty much all the time? It's on there pretty much all the time, isn't it? In fact, um, I just scribbled down a headline. Um, this was, I just looked it up on my, uh, on my phone just then, just to see if si anything's happened in Syria uh, today. And lo and behold, on ABC News in America, uh, it says, this is, this is a headline from around about 10 minutes ago, Syria sees fire at risk as heavy fighting erupts. And that was, as I say, ABC News just a few, a few minutes ago. Because as we know, there's a sort of, um, sort of ceasefire happening right now, isn't there, uh, in Syria. Uh, from the 28th of February up until now, the two superpowers in the world, America and Russia, agreed to try and do a deal over Syria. And they've met up a few times, but nothing has happened yet. Uh, no deal has been done because Assad is the problem. Uh, the president of Syria is man called Assad, and Russia wants him to stay, or at least don't want him kicked out through any other means other than a vote. And what America and the West are saying is, Assad is a mass murderer, in effect, and has got to go. And as we know, there's been terrible, terrible destruction and death in that country, so much so that it's affected Europe. Why has it affected Europe? Refugees, the migrant crisis. We're seeing hundreds of thousands of people in transit on the move. It's the worst uh, migration crisis since the Second World War. That is what is hitting Europe and it's shaking Europe uh, to its foundations. It could literally rip Europe apart, the, the events in Syria. And that's how amazing this, these events are. And what we're going to do uh, this afternoon is have a look and see what the Bible says about Syria because actually it's got quite a bit to say and we're also going to see where Syria fits into the overall prophetical jigsaw puzzle in relation to Jesus coming back um, and I'm hopefully going to show you some pretty amazing things in relation to what God has always said will happen to Syria. Now I could talk for a few minutes about the background of where we are but instead of me talking, I'm going to play, we're going to watch a couple of video clips that last around about a minute or two, because I think they set the scene better than I can. But then what we're going to do is turn to our Bibles, and, and then we'll switch the videos off, and we'll start looking at, uh, at, at, at our Bibles. So here's the first video, which in around about 90 seconds, tries to explain, obviously in 90 seconds, it can't cover all the detail, but it tries to explain in 90 seconds the problem of Syria. In the summer of 2015, Europe experienced the highest influx of refugees since the Second World War. Why? The main reason is that Syria has become the world's top source of refugees. Syria is located in the Middle East, an ancient, fertile land settled for at least 10,000 years. Since the 1960s, it's been led by the Al-Assad family, who have ruled it as quasi-dictators until the Arab Spring happened in 2011, a revolutionary wave of protests and conflicts in the Arab world that toppled many authoritarian regimes. But the Assads refused to step down and started a brutal civil war. Different ethnicities and religious groups fought each other in changing coalitions. ISIS, a militaristic jihadist group, used the opportunity and entered the chaos with the goal to build a totalitarian Islamic caliphate. Very quickly, it became one of the most violent and successful extremist organizations on earth. All sides committed horrible war crimes using chemical weapons, mass executions, torture on a large scale, and repeated deadly attacks on civilians. The Syrian population was trapped between the regime, rebel groups, and the religious extremists. A third of the Syrian people have been displaced within Syria, while over four million have fled the country. The vast majority of them reside now in camps in the neighboring countries who are taking care of 95% of the refugees, while the Arab states of the Persian Gulf together have accepted zero Syrian refugees, which has been called especially shameful by Amnesty International. The UN and the World Food Program were not prepared for a refugee crisis on this scale. As a result, many refugee camps are crowded and undersupplied, subjecting people to cold, hunger, and disease. The Syrians lost hope that their situation will be getting better anytime soon, so many decided to seek asylum in Europe. So there we are, 90 seconds. That's where we're up to. 
And as we've been seeing, there's just been the most horrendous death and destruction for around about five years this has been going on. There's over a quarter of a million people being killed, many of them children, in an unbelievable massacres of, uh, of, of people. This is well before ISIS ever came on the scene. The destruction in Syria is almost beyond belief. And still it goes on. And what happened was, to start with, it was a war internally. But the longer it's gone on, the more other nations have got involved. And eventually, uh, the big superpowers got involved. And as you know, last year, President Putin, pretty much by surprise, certainly the world was not expecting this, last September, suddenly... Uh, sent Russian troops, warplanes, uh, missile batteries, and so on, into Syria itself, totally unannounced. And that began quite a major problem, because America was also, at that point in time, in Syria as well, bombing different groups. There are many, many different groups inside Syria, um, and all of them are sort of trying to fight each other. And it, that's where it gets so, so, so complicated. There's no answers, really, worldly answers to what is going on here. But the world is in a dangerous position right now, of course, because America and Russia, nuclear powers, they're in a Cold War standoff anyway because of the situation in Ukraine when Russia took over Crimea. They're, you know, There's a major standoff between these two guys. Um, and that's why these peace talks that are happening now are in a very fragile state. If it collapses, the next step, the, the reports are saying, the analysts are saying, is even more destruction, far more than even what we've seen uh, so far. Here's a, a, a sort of a news clip of why Russia decided to enter into the Syrian conflict. There are several reasons why Vladimir Putin decided to enter the Syrian war. <laughs> President Putin's action was a shock to the world community. He had been supporting for years President Assad, but almost it appeared overnight. Russia took several actions, sending in a very large amount of military equipment to Syria, air attacks on ISIL, and then finally sending cruise missiles into Syria. This is a deft and very bold move by President Putin to show that he is a player, that he and his country have to be reckoned with. Now, we're not really going to touch much on uh, Russia during this talk, but I'm sure most of you will be aware from prophecies in Ezekiel 38 that Russia is one day going to come down and invade Israel. But isn't it interesting that Russia have taken a step in that direction, pouring troops and army armaments into Syria? You might have heard a few weeks ago that Russia was, was actually withdrawing uh, its planes and tanks and so on, and it's done no absolutely nothing of the kind. Um, all the reports last week are saying, far from withdrawing anything, even more weaponry has been sent um, into Syria over the last few weeks. So the whole thing isn't going away, it's, it's getting worse. And Russia really has uh, put some very, very sophisticated weaponry uh, into Syria. Only on Friday... Um, apparently it shipped in the Iskander missile and the Iskander missile is a nuclear capable missile the West have got nothing that they can uh, use to counteract the Iskander uh, missile it's never left Russia before and now it's been positioned uh, inside uh, Syria I'm not saying they're nuclear armed, they can be uh, but these are devastating missiles with pinpoint accuracy that they can actually change direction even in, in flight to change their targets. They're utterly impossible to fetch down really uh, frightening weapons. And all of this is being poured into this one country. Not only is Russia pouring in weapons, but Saudi Arabia is funding the, the rebels who are trying to fight Assad with uh, not so sophisticated weapons, but lots of weapons all the same. 
So Syria now is a hotbed of weapons, of violence, and of absolute no way that the world can work out a political uh, solution. Just have a look at this. Sorry? Would you repeat the name of the missile? The Iskander. Iskander. Yeah, I-S-K-A-N-D-E-R missile. Um, just have a look at this uh, little video clip that tells us a little bit more about who is fighting who and gives some idea of the complexity of what is going on. So, who's fighting who in Syria? Well, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad is facing an armed uprising in his own country. He's been trying to crush it with help from his friends, Iran, Russia and Hezbollah from Lebanon. On the other side, the US, Turkey and the Gulf Arabs and most of the Western world want Assad to go. They've been arming and training many of the rebels trying to unseat him. The trouble is, one of the main insurgent groups is the so-called Islamic State, who everyone hates, including the other rebels. So now, everyone is all on the same side against IS, right? Well, not quite. Russia says it's only bombing IS, but it has also bombed some of the other rebel groups fighting Assad. Some of them are being funded by Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar, who are rivals of Iran. Meanwhile, the Turks want Assad gone, but they're not bombing him yet. Instead, they're bombing IS a bit, but also bombing the Kurds a lot, who are enemies of Assad, IS and Turkey. But the Kurds are backed by the Americans, who are allies with Turkey. So in sum, Washington's friends are fighting each other who are both also fighting America's main enemy, which in turn is fighting Assad. Simple, it isn't. And that is a, a highly simplified graph of what's going on. There's another one I could have showed you that spirals out into the most horrific, complex picture that you've ever seen in all your life, of people fighting people fighting people. There's so many groups that are now killing each other um, in, in Syria. It defies belief where we've got to. Um, I'm just going to show you some scenes of a suburb. These pictures only came out literally a few days ago because what's happened is Russia has sent in drones, you know, these things that fly around in the sky with cameras, um, and they've just recently been published about a week ago. And this is, uh, this is in downtown Damascus. Now, the bulk of Damascus is still just about in one piece, but just have a look at these pictures that this drone took uh, probably about a month ago now, of a suburb in downtown uh, Damascus. Sort of like the scene of a horror movie, isn't it? Some ap apocalyptical movie. You, I mean, there's nobody there, as you can see. It's absolutely destroyed and deserted. Uh, and this is the reason that particular part of Damascus was destroyed is because there were rebels that were uh, operating that area. So the, the government, Assad, just went in and just obliterated every single solitary building. There's nothing, as you can see. Yeah, there's buildings just about still standing, but... It's, it's just complete ruinous. Um, so this is where we've got to, and this is where we are right now. And the question is, where does this fit in, if at all? Because I'm sure we all know, Syria is sat right on the border of Israel. It's sort of in a quite a prominent position, isn't it, in terms of geographical uh, position. 
has the Bible got anything to say about uh, these events? Are they significant? Because it's certainly bringing the nations of the world uh, together, isn't it? it? Not together in a good way, but uh, together in, in, in a very uh, terrible way. So we're going to have a look in a minute at a number of passages, one of which will be in Isaiah chapter 17. But before we look at Isaiah 17, I'm going to show you that it isn't just us as Christadelphians that are talking about this. I'm going to now show you a news clip uh, that was, I think, NBC News in America on their news channel, just the normal news channel. It's not a Bible uh, channel at all. Uh, and when I saw this, I was quite amazed that on America's general news channel, they were reporting Syria like this. And how about this to think about today? The crisis in Syria may be more than just a current foreign policy problem. With some seeing signs of biblical prophecies of the apocalypse and the events that are unfolding overseas, passages in the Old Testament even make reference to Damascus falling into ruin, sparking worldwide conflict that some say leads to the coming of the Messiah. Joel Rosenberg is a former aide to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and he is a Middle East analyst and has written several books uh, on this issue. Joel, welcome. Good to have you with us today. Good to be with you, Martha. You know, I think it's very interesting uh, to look at this from that historic biblical perspective because in many ways, when, obviously, um, you know, what you have here is, is a clash of civilizations in a larger sense and of Christianity uh, and of radical Islam uh, and this uh, desire for a caliphate on the part of radical Islamists in that part of the world. So explain to us, take us through um, Isaiah and what, what your thinking right. is on, on what the Bible says about this. Well, Martha, it is fascinating. We don't know for certain that the current events are definitely going to play out to be the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. But the implosion of Syria is definitely has people interested. Isaiah 17 and its parallel uh, passage in Jeremiah 49 both describe the absolute destruction, uh, the catastrophic destruction of Damascus at some point in the eschatological future, the end times. Uh, Isaiah 17 verse 1 says... Damascus will be removed from being a city. Uh, one translation says it will cease to be a city. Now, Damascus has been attacked. It's been conquered throughout history, but it's never been removed as a city. It's one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities uh, on the face of the earth, first mentioned in the Bible in Genesis, and now we're still talking about it today. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that coming on our news? Um, you know, we, we wouldn't in this country see that because religion is swept away. But in America, most people are religious, and this therefore makes it into the uh, general sort of news stream. So come and have a look with me at Isaiah 17, which is where they were looking. And we're going to look at this in a little bit of detail, because it's when you look at the detail that you start seeing some amazing things. And we'll also have a look at some parallel passages, as Joel Rosenberg said there, over in Jeremiah 49. But let's start in Isaiah 17. Now... Just to be put Isaiah 17 in context, we're not just plucking this chapter out of uh, the ether, um, but even if we were, these verses would still be relevant. But what chapter 17 of uh, Isaiah is, is, is in effect in a series of national tribulations that are coming on planet Earth before the kingdom is established, i.e. when Jesus returns. And they begin in Isaiah chapter 13, and they go all the way up to Isaiah chapter 24. And there are ten burdens, they're called. And these are what I call uh, national nightmares. Each one is a nation that's a national nightmare that the world cannot sort out. And one of these national nightmares, one of them is Iraq, by the way. The first one is Iraq. Uh, but the next one, or not, not quite the next one, but in Isaiah 17, we've got this national nightmare of Syria. And in uh, Isaiah 17, verse 1, um, it says, The burden of Damascus. Now, Damascus is, of course, the capital city of Syria, and al always has been. And it says, Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, uh, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Now, the amazing thing is, as Joel Rosenberg said just there, Damascus has never, in all of history, failed to be a city. It's never ceased to be a city. 
despite all the wars that have happened over the centuries and millennia over it, it's always continuously been inhabited. But God says here, it's going to be taken away from being a city. It's going to be a ruinous heap. Now, I've shown you some pictures, haven't I, where it looks a little bit like a ruinous heap on its, you know, in its suburbs, but it's all got to go. Now, here is uh, Wikipedia. I, I look up about uh, Damascus, and so here it is, Damascus, look, and it actually says here, it is the oldest continuously inhabited city, or one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. When God says it won't be inhabited, it's going to come to an end, that is going to happen. And isn't it amazing? It says it's a continuously inhabited city. It's never come to an end. Jerusalem has come to an end and been rebuilt, but this place never has come to an end. God says it is. Therefore, it's still in the future. And what we've seen so far isn't the total fulfillment, and I'll prove that to you, because even though the suburbs are, are destroyed, this is sort of how Damascus pretty much looks today. The buildings are still there and people are still going about their daily lives. There's around about 1.7 million people living in Damascus even now. But God says it's going to become a ruinous heap. And what we're going to see is the whole of Damascus eventually looking like the suburbs do at the moment. So something's got to happen. Now before we look at the rest of Isaiah 17, because we're going to look and see what else happens in just a minute... But I want you to come to the parallel passage uh, in Jeremiah chapter 49. So it's the next book after Isaiah. And we're going to have a look. And again, this is not taken out of context. It's in exactly the same context as the chapters Isaiah 13 through to Isaiah 24. But we're just, because of time, obviously just focusing in on this. Now I've put the words on the screen, so I'm going to read them off the screen, but they will follow uh, in your version. Now this particular version, I think it's the New Living Translation, I uh, can't quite remember, but it's a more modern version. But um, anyway, I'm going to read it off the screen. Uh, verse 23 of Jeremiah 49. This message was given uh, concerning Damascus. This is what the Lord says. The towns of Hamath and Arpad are struck with fear, for they have heard the news of their destruction. Their hearts are troubled like a wild sea in a raging storm. Damascus has become feeble, and all her people turn to flee. Fear, anguish, and pain have gripped her as they grip a woman in labor. That famous city, a city of joy, will be forsaken. Her young men will fall in the streets and die, in that day her soldiers will all be killed, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, or that would be the Lord of hosts, as we would normally read that. And I will set to the walls of Damascus, uh, sorry, I will set a fire to the walls of Damascus that will burn up the palaces of Ben-Hadad. We're going to look at who Ben-Hadad is in just a second. Um, but can you see that's a parallel passage to Isaiah 17? It's a similar thing, isn't it? Damascus coming to a complete end. Now let's just have a look at a few bits here. You notice here it says Damascus has become feeble and all her people turn to flee. And here is a headline uh, not, for, not, not really that long ago, probably a few months ago, Syrians fleeing Damascus after years of avoiding war. So the Bible says Damascus has become feeble, all her people turn to flee, our headline in the press says, Syrians fleeing Damascus after years of avoiding war. Can you see how Bible headli headlines in the press are exactly the same as the headlines in the Bible? That's pretty astounding. It doesn't say Damascus is living all peacefully and everybody's having a great time. People are fleeing. This is the refugee crisis. This is people fleeing, actually not only Damascus, but uh, Syria overall. Now, the other thing I thought was, when I was reading this, uh, well, when it says, I will set a fire to the walls of Damascus that will burn up the palaces of Ben-Hadad, I thought, well, who is Ben-Hadad? Because obviously he can't exist right now, because if it was an ancient king, he's long dead. 
But here's a remarkable thing. I'll look at Ben Haydad in Wikipedia. Uh, and this, this is the online uh, dictionary, uh, not dictionary, encyclopedia, sorry. There's Ben Haydad. And the first thing it says is, it refers to any king of Aram Damascus. And in other words, uh, Damascus in Syria. So Ben Hadad, it turns out, is just a title for anybody ruling uh, Damascus. So when God says, I'm going to burn up the palaces of Ben Hadad, he is just using the title. It's a bit like saying, I'm burn up the houses of the Tsar, or burn up the houses of the president, or I'll burn up the houses of the queen or king. He's using the official title of a ruler of Damascus. So this isn't a specific person. This is talking about whoever is ruling Damascus. And who is currently ruling Damascus? Assad. So what do you think I went and did then? I went and looked to see where he lives. Because do you know where he lives? He lives in a palace. See where it says, I'm going to destroy the palaces of Ben-Hadad? So here is where he lives. Now, this is Damascus all around here, and he lives on this hill. It's an utterly impregnable hill. They've scraped the sides of it down so that anybody approaching, they can just take out. No terrorist or somebody wanting to get it. This isn't like the Queen, is it, who lives in Buckingham Palace, surrounded by a city. You could just pretty much barge your way through the gates if you wanted to. This guy has got security like you wouldn't believe around this place. There's one underground road that comes in, all mine, so if anybody was coming in, they'd blow it up. Nobody can get in at him. And he, this, this building that he's living in, you can't see the scale of it, but it's a few million square feet. It's an enormous place uh, with, as you can see, it's highly secure. God says, I'm going to burn the walls of the palaces of Ben-Hadad. And that is going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but we can see with all this turmoil... This is one day going to happen. He thinks he's safe. He clearly isn't safe because God says this is going to happen. Now, here's some other interesting things. You notice up here, it says the towns of Hamath and Arpad are struck with fear. And I thought to myself, that's strange that two cities are mentioned as well as Damascus. So what do I do? I go and look up where Hamath was and where Arpad was. So I go to Wikipedia and I type in Arpad, and look what it says. Arpad, Syria, an ancient city in present-day present day Syria near Aleppo. Anybody heard of Aleppo? No. We've all heard of Aleppo, haven't we? Because we've watched the news. What's happening in Aleppo is it was a stronghold for the rebels. And so it became a city that became poignant to get, you know, for, for the Assad regime to overcome. In fact, Aleppo is the largest city in Syria. It's even bigger than the capital city, Damascus. It was the commercial centre of the whole of Syria. And God has singled it out here as a city that is struck with fear notice. Why? Because they've heard the news of their destruction. Is that pretty much what we see? Hamath, by the way, is very near a place called Homs. Have you heard of Homs? Again, it's also been on the news. It's the other major rebel stronghold. Remarkably, two and a half to so 700 years before Jesus was born, or 2,700 years ago, roughly, there's God saying, here's the cities that you're going to see in trouble. Homs, Aleppo, Damascus, Syria. Um, here's some headlines, look. Bomba this is just from probably um, about a month ago. Bombarded Aleppo lives in fear of siege and starvation. What does the Bible say? Aleppo or Arpad, the people there, are struck with fear. Live in fear. Why? They've heard the news of their destruction. They're surrounded right now by the government Assad forces, Russian planes bombing and goodness knows what else. And you can imagine if you were living there, you would seriously be in fear, wouldn't you? Homs the same. Homs, Syria, inside the city of fear. What does God say? Homs, Hamath, struck with fear. It's astounding. 
Don't you think? Absolutely amazing that it's all written. So I then go on the BBC News site. I type in Syria and, and ask the BBC site to tell me about the current conflict. And up comes a map. That's still on there today. Go and look at it. The three cities that are identified in red as being the major hotspots. Aleppo, Homs, Damascus. God says there's three cities that are going to be in tr trouble. There's Damascus, there's Hamath, and there's Arpad. Exactly the same three. How can that be a coincidence? God knew what was going to happen, and he's telling us in advance that it's going to happen. Oh, and by the way, of course, it says that all the men of war are going to be killed in one day. The destruction that eventually comes on Syria is going to be so cataclysmic, especially on Damascus, everything's gone in a day. Now, I don't know what weapons potentially are going to be used to bring about the destruction of every single fighting man of war in the city of Damascus in one day, but it's got to be an horrendous weapon, has it not? It really, truly has. Come back and have a look at Isaiah 17. If you're still there, you don't have to go anywhere. But let's carry on looking at Isaiah 17 now. So in Isaiah 17, it's the same message. Verse 1, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. Then it says, the cities of Aurora. I don't know quite how you say that, but uh, somebody might tell me a better way of saying it. But, or Aroa, maybe. So the cities of Aroa are forsaken. So I go and look to see where these cities are. I thought they might be in Syria. As it turns out, they're not. Here's where they are. So here is Israel. Syria is up, up here. You reckon, there's Jerusalem. And if you have a look here, look, there are, there's Aurora. So it's down here. Now this is in modern day Jordan. So it's clear that when Damascus falls, there's also a whole lot of trouble, must be, coming on Jordan at the same time. So I'm not entirely certain how they get involved, but it's clear that another nation is also getting involved. Now, Jordan isn't involved right now, but it's clear that if the uh, cities of Aurora are forsaken, there's problems coming uh, into Jordan at the same time. But here's the next bit we're going to look at, because the verses continue, and it's suddenly clear it isn't only Syria that is impacted by this violence and war. Because it goes on and says in verse 3, The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts, and in that day it will come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. So I'm looking at that thinking, wait a minute, this isn't talking about Syria now. Ephraim is nothing to do with Syria, and Jacob, where is it? it's the glory of Jacob, that's nothing to do with Syria either. What is Ephraim, and what is Jacob? Because they are now involved, clearly, in Damascus being taken away from being a city. And this is all to do with Israel. Israel, at some point, is getting involved in the cataclysmic destruction of Syria. Now, let me tell you who Ephraim is. In fact, if you've got the New Living Translation, it doesn't translate it as Ephraim. It puts in the, the two words, northern Israel. And here's why they've decoded Ephraim as northern Israel. If you remember, Israel originally was one great big nation that was all called Israel, wasn't it? And then in the, after the Solomon had passed away and his sons took over, the kingdom got split into two. And the northern kingdom was called Israel and the southern kingdom was called Judah. Ephraim was, the ma was a major tribe that lived in, northern, in, in the northern part of Israel. And when you read the Bible, very, very often... God uses the word Ephraim to describe the whole of the northern kingdom. So here's one incident, incident in Hosea 6 verse 4, where God says, O Ephraim, what am I going to do to you? 
O Judah, what am I going to do to you? He wasn't just saying, what am I going to do to the little tribe here? And what am I going to do to the whole kingdom here? He's using Ephraim to describe the whole northern kingdom of Israel. And many, many, many times that happens. So when God says Ephraim, he means, in many cases, northern Israel. So when we come back to this, if we're decoding it, it's basically saying when Damascus completely fails and becomes a ruinous heap and Jordan's also affected, the fortress is going to cease from northern Israel and the kingdom is also going to cease from Damascus. Yeah? So what does that mean? What does it mean that the fortress ceases from northern Israel. So I looked at the word, there's two things that are going to cease. One is the fortress from northern Israel, and the other is the kingdom of Syria from Damascus. Well, let's deal with this one first. I think the kingdom of Syria ceasing from Damascus is quite clear. What have you, you imagine if London... If, if there was a prophecy in the Bible that says London is going to come to a complete and cataclysmic end and cease to be a city, you would say, wouldn't you, that the kingdom of Britain has effectively come to an end. Because the capital city, if you destroy that, what's left to run the country? There is no country left. It's gone. The kingdom has failed. And that's why the kingdom of Syria ceases when Damascus is taken out because there is no kingdom left. It's gone. It's finished. All the rulers are destroyed. There's just anarchy that is left. What does it mean when it says the fortress will cease from northern Israel? Well, the word fortress literally means a fortress uh, that in old times would have looked like that and in modern times probably looks a bit more like that. But this is talking about the defences of Israel coming to an end. Israel is in trouble its defences are being uh, attacked. And actually the fortress, their defences, are left looking somewhat battered. Here is the New Living Translation that I was um, telling you about uh, in the same verses. So it says in verse 3, The fortified towns of Israel will also be destroyed and the royal power of Damascus will end. All that remains of Syria will share in the fate of Israel's departed glory, declares the Lord of Heaven's armies. In that day, Israel's glory will grow dim, its robust body will waste away, the whole land will look like a grain field after the harvesters have gathered the grain. It will be desolate like the fields in the valley of Rephaim after the harvest. So in other words, when Damascus is completely flattened, when the Syrian nation comes to an end, Israel somehow has got involved. I don't 100% know how, but it has. And Israel itself is greatly weakened. It hasn't come to an end, mind. It survived, but the northern kingdom, the northern part of Israel, has taken quite a severe hammering and beating just at the same time that Syria has collapsed. And in fact, of course, it says the whole land will look like a grain field after the harvest, and that's exactly what a grain field looks like after harvest. But the key points are, Syria is ended and comes to a complete end. Israel survives, but its fortress, a lot of its strength has gone. That's where we get to. But then something really weird happens. Look in verse 7. At that day, Shall a man look to his maker, and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. Now this is quite, I don't quite know, well I'm going to tell you what, by the end of this what I think this is. But something happens where it says a man, not just, this is just general public. That a man will look to his maker, which has got to be talking about God, and his eyes will have respect to the Holy One of Israel. In the, in the modern version, it says, Then at last, the people will look to their creator and turn their eyes to the Holy One of Israel. 
something happens at this very point in time that causes people to understand that there is a God who is a creator. You notice it doesn't say father, it's a creator and a maker. There's suddenly recognition at this point in time that God does exist. Something amazing happens that changes the perspective of the people of the world at that point. But the story isn't even over yet in this chapter because look at verse 12. I'll put a picture on the screen that I think symbolises, this isn't a real tsunami coming in, but you'll see why I've put a picture of an enormous tsunami coming in, uh, because that's what it pretty much says here. It says in verse 12, look, Woe to the multitude of many people, which make a noise like the noise of the seas, and to the rushing of nations, that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations will rush like the rushing of many waters. But God will rebuke them and they'll flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind and so on. So basically what happens now, and I think this is in order, there is suddenly a rushing in to a vacuum that's been left. If you imagine, Syria's gone. Israel has fought a war and has survived maybe even expanded her borders at this point, uh, and, and actually is, is sort of gasping for breath, but is still there. Suddenly, something happens that the world recognises that there is a God, but then, coming out of sort of nowhere, is this humongous army of nations coming in. It's a multitude of people rushing in. These are people that are rushing into the void that is left. And you see there was a huge void that was left. The void of a whole nation of Syria and the void of Israel that's still there but weakened. Here is what I think and where I think all of this fits in. So, in Ezekiel 38, we are told categorically that there is a huge invasion of the nation of Israel. Many, many, many nations coming against Israel. But amazingly, none of the nearby nations of Israel are mentioned in this chapter, not one of them. There's no mention, actually, of Iraq. There's no mention of Syria. There's no mention of Jordan. There's no mention of Egypt. There's no mention of any of these nations in Ezekiel 38. What there is, is mention of an outer ring of nations that come in against Israel. And this outer ring of nations include Magog, Meshach, Tubal and Rosh up here, which is all to do with Russia, Togomar and Goma, which are all to do with Turkey, Persia, which is all to do with Iran, Libya, which is to do with Algeria and Libya, and Ethiopia, it says, which is mainly to do with what's now called Northern Sudan. And these are the nations, it says, that are all going to come in and attack Israel. We're not looking at Ezekiel 38 today. But I'm just telling you, these are the nations that come in, into the void. Now, where are they coming into? They're coming into Israel. But there's no mention of Syria, and there's no mention of Iraq, there's no mention of Jordan. Uh, there is actually mention of Saudi Arabia in Ezekiel 38, because that's part of the, uh, a, a sort of counterforce against all these other nations. But the immediate nations around Israel are not mentioned. And what I believe is is that they're not mentioned because there's been this almighty war and destruction that came first. Where Syria was taken out and Israel was left in a very precarious uh, situation, but survives. In fact, Israel survives pretty well from the point of view that I think that there are a number of prophecies uh, in the Bible that talk about Israel in the future removing what's called their pricking briars, all those people that are surrounding them, that are affecting them at the minute, the Palestinians and Hezbollah and Hamas and uh, Syria that absolutely hates Israel, I think during this coming conflict with Is uh, Syria, actually Israel removes a lot of, if not all, of its surrounding enemies and survives, but into this vacuum pour these outer ring of nations. So what I'm saying to you is, 
There's an inner ring war that happens to start with. And then there's an outer ring war, which is what Isaiah 17 talks about when it says all these nations rush in. All of these nations will rush in. In Ezekiel 38, in verse 8 and 9, have a look at these words. This is a modern translation, and I think it helps us understand what's happening. It says, a long time from now, you, Russia, will be called into action in the distant future. You will swoop down on the land of Israel. Now look at this, which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war. Which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war. Israel, you see, at the point when Russia does invade, will be enjoying peace after recovering from war. A great war that nearly finished them, but didn't. This is the time of safety. This is the time of peace and security in Israel. But they're greatly weakened. But their enemies are gone. Or so they thought. But at the very point when they thought that all was well, all was not well. And in come all of the surrounding nations. Because look what it says. You'll be enjoying peace after recovering from war. And after its people have returned from many lands to the mountains of Israel, you and your allies, still talking about these nations in dark black up there, a vast and awesome army will roll down on them like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. That's Isaiah 17, the great flood of nations coming in. It's exactly the same thing that basically is going to come upon Israel. So there they are, all of them. Coming against Israel. This is the flood. This is the tsunami of nations coming against it, coming against them. Now you might say, well, you might say, I've, why don't I shut up? Because I should have finished probably by now. But I've just got a couple of slides to show you. Are you okay just for a second? Sure? You haven't got much choice because I've decided I'm going to finish this. You might say, well, this is all sort of well and good, but where else does it put this this picture in place? Surely, if you're right, that there's a an initial war against Israel, and they survive. And then there's another war against Israel, and this time it's crisis time, and, and actually maybe they're defeated. What, where does it sort of say that elsewhere? Zachariah. And you're right. It says it in Zechariah. Because, and I hadn't really seen this before. But here's the point. In Zechariah 12, and in Zechariah 14... We're told about two completely different events. And until last year, I'd always read them as, as identical events. I'd always read Zechariah 12 as being exactly the same event as Zechariah 14. Just repeat it. I don't know whether you had done that. That's certainly how I had read it. Until I read it properly. And here's what it looks like when you read it properly. It looks like two completely and utterly separate events. One, the first one here, is telling us about the initial inner ring war where Israel survives. The second one is telling us about the huge nations that come in and actually Israel does not survive. Not at that point. Here, yeah, two thirds will be taken away. So have a look at this. In verse 2, Zechariah 12 it says, I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations stagger when they send their armies to Jerusalem and Judah. So the nearby nations. I think in, your, in the AV version, I think it says, uh, it says the people round about. And I think because it says roundabout, I thought, well, maybe that means, you know, just about everywhere. But it doesn't. The Hebrew word means close by or nearby. We're specifically being told that Israel is being attacked by people close and near to them. Well, you can't for the life of me tell me that Russia is near them or Iran is near them. They're not. These are nearby nations that send their armies. Now, look what happens in verse six. On that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a flame that sets a wood pile ablaze, or like a burning torch among the sheaves of grain. Remember the grain field? 
They will burn up all the neighbouring nations, right and left, while the people living in Jerusalem remain secure. Jerusalem survives this inner ring war. The nearby nations are obliterated. They are taken out. Israel's on fire. Israel uses that fire to destroy the very nations round about it. The nearby nations are finished. Jerusalem has survived. Jerusalem is intact. It is secure. This is the inner ring war that's being described here. This is the Syrian conflict and the Hamas conflict and the Palestinian conflict and the Hezbollah conflict and the Jordanian conflict that will take place here in Zechariah 12. But now look at Zechariah 14. I will gather all the nations to fight against Jerusalem. Is Jerusalem secure? Is Jerus- does Jerusalem overcome? Well, no, because it says the city will be taken and the houses looted and the women raped. Half the population will be taken into captivity and the rest will be left among the ruins of the city. That doesn't sound like Jerusalem secure to me, does it to you? This is Jerusalem ransacked. This is the nation finally brought to an end. Verse 5, you will flee through this valley for it will reach across to Azor. Yes, you will flee as you did from the earthquake in the days of the king Uzziah. Then my Lord God will come and all his holy ones with him. You see, what happens is, when the Lord God comes, and this really is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, not God himself. When Jesus finally comes at this point, the holy ones are with him. It actually says in the AV, the saints are with him. Who are the saints? Us. In other words, what must have happened by this point The judgment must have taken place. And do you know something? It has. Jesus has returned and judged the saints in between the final destruction of Syria and the absolute destruction of Israel when Russia comes down. Jesus will have come back in between these two. Categorically, he's back in between the two. And do you know how I know that? Have a look at Zechariah 12. And verse 10. So we're going back to the first stage. And in amongst the first stage, look what we are told. Verse 10. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they will look upon me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. This is the return of Jesus. But you see, what's going to happen is, Jesus is coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory before the judgment has taken place. We will see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. And that is exactly what is happening here. Jesus is going to come in the clouds of heaven, the literal clouds of literal heaven, and the trumpet will be blown, and then the dead are raised, and then the judgment starts taking place. And actually, this is precisely what we're reading there in Zechariah 12. In fact, in Revelation 1 verse 7, it says the same thing. Look. He, Jesus, comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn. It won't only be Israel in mourning, but in bitterness and weeping and wailing, because that's what the word mourn means. They're weeping and wailing. They go pretty hysterical. But do you know something? When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory... There's still the final war to come. Even though the world has seen him come, the major war still happens. And people have said to me, well, that can't happen because if they've seen Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven, why would there still be another war? But there will be. And you know something else? Even when Christ is reigning as king in Jerusalem, Revelation 17 tells us that even when he's king in Jerusalem, the European forces headed up by the false religion of Rome will actually attack the Lord Jesus Christ, when he's established as king. It makes no odds that Jesus has appeared in the heavens. It makes no odds that 
uh, Jesus is here on earth, those who are anti him will still fight against him. And you know something? That's no different whatsoever to what happened when he was first here. He was raising people from the dead. He was, he was healing the blind. He was raising people up to, to walk again. And what did they say? Let's kill him. He did it by Beelzebub. Let's kill him. It would be exactly the same. Jesus is coming. He's coming soon. And the final slide I was going to show you is this. One of the last times Damascus is mentioned in the Bible was when a certain man called Saul was on his way there. And it says he was near by Damascus. And when he was near by Damascus, he saw a great light in heaven. And the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to him and he said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to go and I want you to start preaching. And this man became, instead of a murderer, somebody that went and wrote a third of your Bible and preached to the Gentiles. So that we sat here in Britain right now are reading the Bible predominantly down to this man who saw Jesus in the heavens as a bright light. And there he was in Damascus when that happened. It tells you he was in Damascus, or very near it, it says. And guess what? When Damascus comes to an end very shortly, the time of the Gentiles will be up. Because when Jesus appears in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, there's another bright light in the sky, and I don't quite know what it will look like when we see him, but we will. That is game over for the Gentiles. Because when Jesus appears in the clouds of heaven, faith has come to an end. You can't be saved through baptism after Jesus has physically appeared. It is impossible. Faith has finished. And therefore, when Damascus falls and Jesus appears, the work of the, uh, the Apostle Paul that began at Damascus will finish at that exact same point. So I think these events in Syria are very, very significant. And I think something is going to happen there at some point. Whether it's days, weeks, months or years, I don't know. But I do know it's coming to an end. And I do know Jesus will return when that does happen. And then Jesus will finally call us to be judged somewhere. And finally we'll come to, with him as the saints to uh, Jerusalem, having been judged when Russia, which we probably won't have seen any of that, takes place and comes against Israel. Hopefully that was interesting. There's a lot to get through. Thank you for listening.